Hi guys, and welcome to the first installment of Way2Indie.com's Secret Stash, uh, a series in which we talk to filmmakers, actors, critics, and uh, anybody involved in the movie biz about films that they believe are essential cinema, but perhaps uh, have gotten little to no attention or recognition because maybe they're too obscure, too foreign, too weird, or, uh, of course, too indie. Uh, now, every cinephile enjoys having these terrific little gems of films tucked away in their back pockets that, you know, we can whip out to impress our friends with. And on this series, we're going to ask these talented people and filmmakers uh, to share with you some of their most beloved, hard-to-find films so that you can put them on your watch list, spread the word, and, you know, impress your f buddies in the process. Uh, joining me for this first episode of Secret Stash... Uh, to share some of his favorite obscure films is Eddie Mullins, uh, a New York filmmaker who was a film critic for eight years, writing mostly at Black Book magazine, but also contributing to Films and Reviews, Slant, and Hustler. His first feature film is Doomsdays, a comedy about two guys played by Justin Rice and Leo Fitzpatrick, who, believing the world as we know it, is coming to an end due to the imminent threat of peak oil, uh, choose to live a vagabond lifestyle in the Catskills, ransacking rich people's unoccupied vacation homes, guzzling booze, breaking stuff, and uh, talking shit to each other along the way. When the duo take on a, two new companions, a chubby teen played by Brian Charles Johnson and a pretty girl, uh, plucky girl, uh, but played by Laura Campbell, it dis disrupts their whole pre-apocalyptic plan. The film won the award for Best Narrative Film at SF Indie Fest, where I spoke to Eddie Mullins. You can find that conversation on the website. And Eddie joins us now. How are you, Eddie? I'm great. Greetings from Kingston, New York. Amazing. So you're coming from your home in Kingston, right, where you shot Doomsdays, of course. Absolutely. In fact, uh, the room that, that I'm in uh, is featured pretty prominently um, in, the, uh, in the picture. Oh. Uh, uh, and I actually wrote most of the things sitting in, right here in this chair, so it's all uh, it's all of a piece. Oh man, that, that's really special. And uh, talk about how the film's going. You still doing the festival thing? I mean, it was it, it obviously killed it over at SF Indie Fest. You know, I don't know if it's uh, like the hive mind. I, I think somebody said once that the the surest sign of winning a, of winning more awards is to win one. And as soon <laughs> as we won SF Indie. Like, four days later, we won the Eastern Oregon Film Festival as well. Fantastic. Uh, so, which is great, because now I, I've been able to you know, cross that threshold, or, or Rubicon, if you will. I no longer have to address my film as critically acclaimed. I can now say award-winning, with total legitimacy. <laughs> That's so, it. You know, That's this your ticket. Been, yeah, so I, that, that, I don't know, small, small victories, but uh, it's big, big, big for me. That's good, yeah. Uh, the film totally deserved it. Uh, talk about your taste in, in movies. Uh, you know, we obviously, in the film, if you watch the film, it's a really beautiful, beautiful picture. Um, you, uh, you really are, a, you know, a director of the shot and not the edit. You, you're not cutting much at all in the film. What, what are your tastes like? What's your palette? What kind of filmmakers do you enjoy? Well, I, I think generally um, I'm mostly interested in alternatives to... Uh, to, to what uh, uh, has been called the industrial mode of representation. This is Noel Birch's phrase. That, and, and, and that's just code for, like, what Hollywood does. Uh, and I'm, I'm interested in formal departures from that. Uh, which So uh, big directors for me are always ones who seem to have basically their own set of rules that they somehow, like, bypassed you know, the lectures about the 180 degree rule or matching sight lines or whatever. So anyone from like, um, you know, Miklos Jankso, the Hungarian director who just orchestrates these huge elaborate shots, I mean, that go on for like 10 minutes sometimes and they're so exquisitely composed. They must, I mean, I, I assume they just spent a day on each shot. Like there's no other way to have done it. Um, but I'm equally enamored with Someone like Jean-Luc Godard. Uh, I'm a I'm a huge. I like all the Russians. Uh, I think probably my favorite filmmaker of all time would be Carl Dreyer. Nice. Um, all right. So so I like I like the the sort of sui generis people um, that kind of push 
that sort of push on the walls of all the like sort of basic assumptions that that I think people make about what filmmaking is. You know, I I think it, like particularly Hollywood filmmaking has become like uh, you know I think maybe I said in the, our last interview to me it's like it's like air or capitalism or something that just we've been born into it. It's always been there and and we just sort of take it for granted. And I think when oftentimes when people that have been conditioned by only watching Hollywood films, and when they see something that deviates from that, their instinct is to say, oh, that's bad. And it's like, right. you know, I'd like for people to get past this idea that there's only, you know, there's only one way of doing things. Um, well, so you know, it is knowing that, I'm excited to, to hear your picks for, for, for these oh. films. You, you gave up, so, so you dropped a, a lot of gems uh, in our last conversation, which actually I want to say for all our readers, uh, it was the whole inspiration for this show, uh, talking to you in San Francisco. I was just, I was so, I was so riveted by by uh, your encyclopedic knowledge of the, these, uh, it's a, frankly, uh, these directors I'd never heard of, and that I researched uh, subsequently of, and have, uh, you know, enjoyed. So, now I want to say the way this is going to work is we're going to split Eddie's picks into three levels, uh, with each subsequent level's film being harder and harder to find, and therefore uh, cooler and cooler for you to show off to people because less people have seen it. Now on level one, we're going to scratch the surface with a film that is ready, readily available on streaming services like Netflix and Hulu. Uh, still obscure films, but you, you can find them if you want to very easily. Uh, level two are going to be films that you can only find in a physical copy, physical format, so DVD, Blu-ray, or Laserdisc, if, if <laughs> you want to be so daring. <laughs> um, and level three are, is the hardcore level, the level where you have to freaking bootleg the film or get it imported from some country halfway across the world. These are films that aren't readily available in this country, but if you have the cojones to seek them out, you're guaranteed to be the coolest kid on the block, at least to your fellow movie lovers. Uh, uh, does that sound good, Eddie? Yeah, that sounds great. All right, so with that, uh, let's jump into your picks. Level one, what's your film that you can our readers can find uh, streaming online? Uh, well, the picture that I've chosen is uh, it's called Death by Hanging, and it's uh, uh, by the Japanese film director uh, Nagisa Oshima. And the reason that I love the picture, and it's very much in keeping with what we were saying before, is that uh, out of all his uh, experiments, you know, he's often referred to as the Japanese Godard, uh, mm -hmm. this one is the most Brechtian. Uh, it was not a play beforehand, but to watch it, uh, you'd, you'd think it might have been, because it all takes place in um, basically in one location. And what, what it's about is a, a Korean soldier has been uh, condemned to death to death by hanging, obviously, for uh, a rape that he committed. And when they try to hang him, uh, he survives. He doesn't die. His, dark, his heart doesn't stop beating. And the group of people who are there to witness the execution suddenly are in a quandary, and they're like, well, we can't just hang him again if he's unconscious. The law says the subject has to be awake. And then when he finally regains consciousness, he has suffering from total amnesia. He doesn't know who he is. And so what begins is this insanely uh, satirical story whereby the guards try to explain to him what he did, and they start taking on various roles and reenacting, like trying to get him to reenact the rape. Huh. And, and, it, and it just it reaches this level of absurdity. It's, it's extremely anti-authoritarian. Um, it... Uh, uses a lot of I uh, sort of it, it's a very layered story uh, it, it has a lot to do with uh, you know at the time I guess uh, anti-korean uh, uh, racism in in China it's uh it's just a ballsy movie um, and, and it, it goes to a place that that just it seems so wildly unpredictable and strange especially in our current sort of film climate it's just it, it, I don't know. I, I, I would love to see, you know, we talked about uh, Yasuzo Masumura the last time. And right. he's also, you know, like, like Oshima, very, very politically engaged filmmaker. Um, you know, Oshima actually had to start his own studio because when he made uh, Night and Fog in Japan, it was uh, so controversial and they thought it was going to stir people up so much that they, the studio pulled it. 
And so he just he quit the studio and started his own production company as a result. So really, just a maverick film from a maverick filmmaker. Oh man, sounds like a great pick. I look forward to checking that one out. And where where can we check that out? That uh, out. What streaming site can we find that film on? Believe it or not, Criterion is streaming it on Hulu. Um, no I don't know why they haven't put the film out. Uh, I don't know why it's not the biggest thing. They put out a very fine box set in the Eclipse series of his, I think it's called Oshima's Experimental 60s or something. And it has all the other greatest hits from that era, but for some reason not Death by Hanging. And then they went on to put out Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, the picture you did with David Bowie, and uh, what Empire Passion in the Realm of the Senses. Uh, you know, great films all, but like, i uh, born a death by hanging man, I'll die a death by hanging man. This is the picture for me. So I'm really hoping that they're just biding their time. I'd like some commentary. I'd like Kent Jones to write a little booklet full of crap. Right, right, right. Yeah. Classic. All right. That sounds really great. Uh, death by hanging, our first level pick. This is for you wussies out there who just want to sit on your butt and... Uh... You know, watch watch a great movie, but you know, you know, indie way too indie is all about digging for the good stuff. So let's dig even deeper. Level two, uh, fil a film that you can only find on DVD or Blu-ray or, uh, like I said, laser disc. Oh, which I don't I know if anyone. <laughs> do you have a laser disc? Uh, no. But I was oh. gonna say I do, have, I do have a visual aid for this one. Oh, nice. So shall I go? Go ahead. All right, this picture has been put out by the good folk at the uh, uh, Warner Archives, so you can get it on demand. You know, uh, you can't buy it in a store, but you can buy it. All right. And it's uh, 1971, Dusty and Sweets McGee. Now, this film is like the great lost, like, uh, cult classic of, of, of this era. It was, it, was, it was written and directed by this guy, Floyd Mutrux. Or maybe Floyd it's Mutrux. I don't know. This was his first picture, and it's all about junkies. Um, but the important thing to understand is that there, there really weren't, you know, we didn't, there was no culture of junkie movies at that time. This was really some cutting edge stuff. And he made it, I don't know how he convinced Warner Brothers to pay for it. He had been in the story department at Warner Brothers. I think he's actually an uncredited writer on um, Tulane Blacktop, which oh, wow. was a huge influence on me and, and I think on Doomsdays as well. But um, anyway, this was his first picture. And he got William Fraker to shoot it, who you know went on to do William Shock, uh, Fraker did everything from, he did Bullet, he did Rosemary's Baby. Hell, he did Tombstone. He had, a, he had a nice long career. And so he was the main DP on it. But because they thought they were making, like, some sort of message movie uh, rather than a more kind of lurid exploitation film, which some people have alleged it is, uh, he got – he was like, hey, Laszlo Kovacs, you want to come help me shoot this thing? And so, here's the, you know, you've got, like, two of the best DPs of their era making this sort of quasi-documentary – narrative kind of thing about, about these hustlers and junkies in Los Angeles uh, you know, in the late 60s. And it's lousy with great music. Um, almost all of the performers in it are actual addicts. Uh, I'm wow. pretty sure most of them are dead. Uh, when I, if someone asked, I went to a screening at the, at the uh, Walter Reed Theater in um, Lincoln Center, uh, and he, he was there. And, and people asked, you know, what had become of these people? And he was like, oh, I'm pretty sure they're all dead. I have no idea. But, I mean, wow. they're, they're just honest-to-God junkies. And then, like, the one actor in the film is this guy, Billy Gray. He plays a dealer. And he was, the, he was a child star. He was the kid on Father Knows Best. Oh, and, great. And somehow he's in this movie, and he's got, like, uh, a swastika tattoo, and he's got long, greasy hair. And, um, and I, I think that... Uh, Leonard Malton, in his uh, you know annual movie guide, actually alleged that the reason he was in the film was because he was a drug addict. And Billy Gray wrote and was like, absolutely not. And Leonard Malton had to issue a public apology and <laughs> change the entry in his book on Dusty and Sweets McGee. But like, uh, there's an opening sequence where I, I would call this um, what David Boardwell uses the term that I think is very useful—a network narrative. 
you know, that you're, you're dealing with a group of people. In the same way Shortcuts or Magnolia would be a network narrative. Mm -hmm. that you kind of go around in this ambit, and there's certain people that sort of come in and out, and they're all loosely related. Um, but uh, it, it, it has just an astonishing use of cutting and music at the very beginning that, to me, is, is the equal of what Scorsese was doing at the time. Wow. Uh, they're always listening to the radio, and there's a lot of pop music, and he, and he, and he, he, he cuts around. Uh, it's like the radio dial is changing, and the music switches all the time. And you're visiting with all the different characters. It's, it's yeah, I, I, it's amazing to me that Warner Brothers ever put it out. It played for one week, and then they yanked it uh, wow. because... The brass thought it was too controversial, and the and then right after, right after that, uh, Al Pacino's Panic and Needle Park came out, and those are really like the first two American films, you know, unless you want to count really campy depictions like, uh, you know, Otto Preminger did an adaptation of uh, of Nelson Algren's Man with a Golden Arm, and mm. Frank Sinatra is like uh, pretending he's a junkie, and and the dealer is a uh, what's his name, Darren McGavin, the dad from from Christmas Story. No kidding. Yeah, and it's it's just ridiculous. And Frank Sinatra's on the floor, like ah, like clutching his arm. <laughs> but, um, Panic in Needle Park and and Dusty and Sweet Sugi were the first two pictures that really sort of got in your face about you know junkie life in America. And uh, and now of course both enjoy I think pretty great cult status. So and Dusty and Sweets McGee, that this so so Dusty and Sweets McGee is for who who for for. Uh, Fans of what kind of film? Who 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 should uh, take the time to uh, you know get this uh, disc through the Warner Brothers archives? I mean, I, I think of it in most general terms that it's like a great sort of time capsule from 1970. Mm. Um, you know, it just there's the cast of characters includes uh, you know some very young junkies. Uh, an older sort of wizened kind of junkie. There's a there's a uh, uh, this, uh, I don't know. Uh, oh, this guy. Uh, what's his name? Rip Taylor or something. He used to be a scenester at Max's Kansas City, and he's like a male hustler, and he's wearing like <laughs> like tight leather pants. Uh, <laughs> you know, like like Duke of Earl is playing as he walks down the street. It's um yeah for anybody who's interested in like. Los Angeles in the sort of like heady post summer of love like ugly phase. This is uh, this is this is a real prize. And like I said, the music in it is uh, you know it's kind of wall to wall. You know, and I just look at it I'm like, oh, Taco Bell signs used to be like that. Like there's a lot of <laughs> sort of street culture and stuff. So yeah, and then people who just like I don't know. I suppose that there is a genre of uh, films about. Uh, about drug use and abuse, uh, but this is way more discomforting than, say, uh, train spotting. You know, this is oh, okay. these, these are actual junkie. Like, there is live shooting up in the picture. It's not for the, the faint of heart. Now, I'm going to challenge you with something here. I didn't tell you about this. I'm, maybe oh. I'll blindside you here, see, uh, see, see what happens, but... If you were to... This, this is an obscure film, obviously. If you were to pair this film with maybe a more mainstream one for a double feature, what would you pair it with? Ooh. Well, my first instinct would probably be to pair it with another um, Floyd Muttrix film because his mm -hmm. things are so little seen. Um, he did a picture about uh, called American Hot Wax, uh, about this, like, sort of DJs and the doo-wop era and everything. Um, so that would be one choice. And then if I wanted to make more of a thematic pairing, uh, hmm, that's a toughie. Gotcha. How about, <laughs> uh, you could pair it, uh, well, I don't like this movie, but you could pair it with Rush. Okay. If you, if you like, uh, who was it? Somebody called Jason Patrick, uh, in a film review I read once, it's called that Jason Patrick, that refugee from the planet of dull, handsome men. And I thought, yeah, that's <laughs> spot on. That's that's who that guy is. B two. <laughs> that was the apex of your career. Oh. So great. Yeah. That's so great. Um, now uh, let's get into the good stuff. This is 
I'm excited to hear your pick for this. This is level three. This is the film that you ha- you can't find uh, at least through legal means here. You've got to bootleg it or import it or some some other way. Find find your man downtown. And get him, get him to get a hold of it for you. Um, what is your pick for level three? The film that you can't find uh, anywhere really. All right. So for my pipe hitting, I dare you to watch it. Impossible to get film. I chose. 1929's The New Babylon. Whoa. That's this artwork. Now, The New Is Babylon... That a Blu-ray? No, it's, uh, just a, it's just a DVD and a Blu-ray okay. box. Okay. <laughs> now they sent it. Um, I mean, it's how I found it. Oh, um, right, right. This uh, is, is slides right into... Uh, you know, cheek by jowl with all the great Russian films and filmmakers that we hear about a lot more often. Uh, Pudovkin, Eisenstein, Dovchenko, uh, you know, these guys get a lot of love. Um, this picture uh, was actually made by two people who don't get talked about nearly so often. Uh, it was a co-directing team of, I'm sure I'll get the names just terribly wrong, but I believe it's Leonid Trauberg and Gregory Kostinstev or something like that. And this was their third film. Uh, I've never been able to get a hold of the first two. Uh, one of them is called The Devil's Wheel. But it was born out of uh, this experimental theater group that they had that was called The Factory of the Eccentric Actor. Huh. Or FEX for short. Though I don't know. That doesn't quite add up. But anyway, um, <laughs> so they had this, this acting group and... Um, in the main, you know, films about, uh, from this era, uh, in this, uh, you know, Soviet montage era, as it's referred to, or the, you know, historical materialist phase or whatever, uh, the films are generally tend to all be about things going on in Russia. Um, they commemorate events. You know, for example, uh, uh, both, I think, uh, uh, Dovchenko's Earth and Eisenstein's October were, you know, commissioned, state commissioned films to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the revolution. Or uh, but the films tend to have, you know, similar, um, similar locations, similar subject matters, but they're all, you know, about someone coming to correct consciousness, you mm-hmm. know, and sort of uh, starting off naive and then, you know, like in the end of St. Petersburg and then joining the, the good fight and becoming a, a good Bolshevik. And, and what makes this film stand out is that it's the only one that I know of that actually takes place, like, in a completely different time and place. It is, uh, it is about, in fact, the uh, Paris Commune of 1871, and it kind of highlights uh, some certain events of the, of the Franco-Prussian War, and then, uh, and then goes on to tell the story of, of the Paris Commune. And it, it does this primarily through... Um, uh, this girl's Jean, and she works in a um, uh, 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 department store, a very fancy department store that's called the New Babylon. And uh, most of the film is is about uh, you know, criticizing the bourgeois culture of the of the Second Empire, and uh, you know a lot of like the rhetoric in all of these Russian films, a lot of very obvious sort of cross cutting where they like show you know the. The, the guy who owns the factory, like, living it up at the cabaret and, like, getting drunk and then, you know, cut to, like, Jean's mom who's, like, a washerwoman at home and she's raking right. it. And her dad's, like, some kind of cobbler. It doesn't matter. You see him, like, with a hammer, like, very <laughs> sadly, like, Meh. And then um, when, the, when, the, when the bougies, as it were, kind of conspire uh, with the Prussians to surrender Paris... Uh, you know the, the proletarians, and in particular in this film, proletarian women decide, no, we're not going to let you take the guns to Versailles. We're going to defend Paris, and they ultimately lost and were all executed. But I think, uh, in in sort of Bolshevik culture, for lack of a better word, like that was considered a, a sort of antecedent to to you know the 1917 uh, October. And, and so it, it, it loomed very large in the sort of, like, history that they were writing of themselves. Now, what I think is so, you know, all of that aside, that's really just context. What's so astonishing to me is the use of space. And is this, this, they're, like, 
what we I would like cool Shavian things where he, he does all of these eye lines across the film that would be completely impossible. But 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 nevertheless, you know, so it's like the, the proletarians are over here on a hill with their spectacles and and then or not the not the proletarians, excuse me, the factory owners and the and the bourgeois are on the hill with their spectacles. And then we cut to inside, you know, the factory where Gene's trying to find some something you know, something to be useful for the for the communards. And uh, and and these people couldn't possibly be looking at each other. They're separated by miles. But he'll he'll make these kind of connections for mm -hmm. rhetorical purposes, but also you know that they they technically work. You know, they they seem to be looking at one another. And there's in the, there's a scene in the opening uh, where there's this huge you know they're showing the the decadence of the culture and uh, how you know the, the the Parisians associate war with spectacle and 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 you know consumption. And and uh, you never get you know in the same way that uh, you know Kulshov would operate, or I would also argue for for Dovchenko, you never get like a wide shot. Okay. There's just this kind of loose sense of space, and you get that everyone's here and everything, but the eye lines never quite work. You never get to establish where everyone exactly is. And I I just you know, this sort of gets back to what I was saying at the opening. Like I love things that have they're a totally like unique. Uh, interpretation of how to represent space. I mean, this is the fundamental craft of filmmaking, and and um, and this is just—it's just so—it's so—it seems so wild. You know, the first time I saw it, I was like, "This is a revelation." You know, I haven't felt like this since like when I discovered Cassavetes when I was like 19. It was like, "Holy shit!" Killing a Chinese bookie just changed my life. You know, you have those feelings less and less, I think, as you get older. But when I discovered this film a couple of years ago, I was like. You know, it's one of those where you just grab your crotch and go, everything just changed! Right, right, right. Now, okay, so that's your uh, heart and core pick. Uh, now give your final pitch on why people should uh, seek this out. And, and be actually, before you say that, how did you find this movie? Um, I had read about it, and then I think I just found someone on eBay who had a copy of it. Okay, so so not not so hard to dig for, and uh, what why why should people seek this out, no matter what kind of film they're into? Well, it is uh, in a very unusual, and I think unusually diverting um, picture from one of the greatest eras of filmmaking the world has ever known. I mean, I think that you know we always to me there's sort of a holy trinity, Dovchenko and and Eisenstein. And Pudovkin, but then you've got on the edges. There's uh, there's Medvedkin who did Happiness, mm -hmm. and then you've got these guys doing New Babylon. Uh, it's it's such a small canon, and I, I feel like even if you go through film school, at best you're probably going to get exposed to like the Odessa step sequence uh, from Potemkin, and that's what you know you're just supposed right. to learn everything about like montage cutting and blah 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 from watching that. Um, and I just feel like this is. This is the undiscovered gem. I probably would have gotten into the Russians a lot sooner if I had seen this picture first. Because like I said, okay. it doesn't, it has such, it, because of its, its uh, some of its um, artistic flourishes, which I, I believe it was criticized for, for being too too complex, you know, the, the, the idea was that you weren't supposed to do anything that would, that would confound or confuse, uh, you know, the illiterate peasants who they wanted to show the film to, and... Uh, uh, and I think right. this was this was reckoned um, a bit a bit too smarty pants, um, but at the same time, that's what I love about it. You know that it that it that it takes place in Paris, and that it does have this sort of distinct um, distinct flavor that I think separates it from other films in the genre. And I think I think it would reinvigorate someone's interest in the genre of of uh, you know Russian montage films. Period. You know, I think. Uh, you could do a lot worse than watch Dovchenko's Earth over and over and over again. And that, I mean, that that to me is like the, the granddaddy of all, like, uh, you know, so many challenges to, like, like your cognitive understanding of where people are and what's going on. I just, I eat that shit up. Right. Now let's let's do an overview of uh, our three films, your three picks. Level one, we had uh, Death by Hanging. By Hanging, right? which I don't think I gave a year for. But it's 19... Nope, this doesn't even say. I want to say 1968, but... Mm. Okay. 68's uh, Death by Hanging, and then uh, Level 2, we had... Well, oh, gosh, uh, this is such a great title. Uh, Dusty and Sweets. 
McGee. That's it. <laughs> Justin Fleets McGee by That's Floyd Woodruff. That's the best title I've heard in a long time. <laughs> it is. It doesn't I mean, even sound real. It, well, and then it, you, the film barely, never really even identifies like who they are. I had to read about it, and it's like these, you know, it's two of the junkies in the movie, but they're they're never identified as Dusty and Sweets McGee. So it's, yeah, it's out there. <laughs> and of course, level three, a new Babylon, right? Yeah, Leonard Trauberg and Gregory, impossible to say names. <laughs> Gregory K. All right, well, I think this has been a great episode, uh, first episode for Secret Stash. Uh, all, for all you way 2 indie readers and all you YouTube viewers, you've just been gifted three films to go seek out, to, to uh, uh, find, dig up, and enjoy for yourselves and share with your friends and uh, show off and uh, add to your uh, cinematic uh, acumen. Uh, thank you. Eddie Mullins for your picks and for taking the time Any, to chat with us. Anytime, man. It's fun. And also, uh, thanks again for giving me the idea for the show in the first place, and we hope to have you on again. Well, I'd love to. Let me know. I have, uh, I have all sorts of uh, little treasures in my, in my, in my uh, DVD collection. Uh, let me know. I believe it, and uh, thank you guys for watching. We'll see you again with Secret Stash very soon, and uh, if you're watching this, uh, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, visit the website, of course, uh, click subscribe on YouTube, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, guys. Later. <laughs>